I'm just getting over a cold and some laryngitis. We'll see how see how long I can talk today. Um, let's see. All right. So um, talk about um, some endocrine, renal, all these things um, related to a case. Um, an actual case, a patient that I saw the first time about a year ago. And the patient is a 42-year-old woman, uh, presented to her physician, family medicine resident, complaining of polyuria and polyhypsia, started about two weeks earlier. And she reported drinking up to 12 liters of fluid, fluid or more daily. And her only other complaint was fatigue, um, which she attributed to her thirst um, and polyuria because she was up every hour or two at night and um, couldn't sleep. Um, she did have mild intermittent headaches that were really unchanged. She denied any visual symptoms, rhinorrhea, uh, history of diabetes, or any symptoms suggestive of. Uh, anterior pituitary dysfunction. And just very briefly, uh, past history was not too remarkable. Um, abnormal lipids, was a bit overweight, history of anxiety and low back pain. Her only medication was vitamin D, no allergies, no tobacco or alcohol. She worked in a factory. No exposure noted. Um, and family history was really unremarkable. Um, as was her review of systems, um, which included normal menstrual periods. On physical exam, um, she was healthy appearing. Uh, her BMI was 29, normal blood pressure, normal heart rate. And basically, her exam was completely unremarkable. Okay, so, so we have someone whose she's complaint is um, basically her only complaint, except for fatigue, um, which is polyuria and polydipsia. Um, and um, any questions, any other questions you'd want to ask this patient? At this point, any other historical information? And yeah, actually, all that was normal. Um, no? Okay, so um, when we think about water balance, um, certainly it's important to consider that, that what, we, um, what we excrete um, is in large part uh, what governs what we take in, uh, at least when it comes to a, a minimum intake. And if you look at the, right at the water output, um, I mean, these are obligatory losses. Um, you pretty much need to produce 400, 500 uh, milliliters of urine daily. And why is that? Why do we have to produce 400 cc's of urine daily? You're only taking 100, and why not? Yeah, and then in general, now certainly if, and if my solutes generally refers to protein and salt, 
because they have a major cell you that, that control your output. Um, so, I mean, I mean, technically, if you really reduce your sodium intake, your protein intake, you're not eating, um, your urine output can drop fairly low. But there is a limit. Um, and therefore, um, there has to be about the same amount of ingested water. Um, certainly, if you're eating a, a typical diet, a lot of water um, comes from the diet, um, there's water of oxidation. But in the average person, you need about 400 uh, cc's of water a day. Not, not a whole lot. And then, of course, there's the elective water intake. Um, and whatever you, you take in electively over here is usually going to come out over here. So, in terms of regulation of water intake and output, the, the primary regulator, the primary hormone, at least, is uh, ADH, which in humans is energy and vasopressin, uh, which is a 9 amino acid peptide, um, similar in structure to the only other hormone of the neural hypothesis, oxytocin, but clearly they have different, um, uh, different functions. And, um, and I'm, I'm sure people um, are familiar with this um, image of the pituitary and hypothalamic anatomy. Um, and it's very important to keep in mind that when it comes to ADH, um, secretion of ADH is different than the secretion of anterior pituitary hormone because it's, it is a neurohormone, a neurohormone secreted by these neurons that come from these two nuclei in the hypothalamus. And uh, although these neurons end in the posterior pituitary, um, the reality is if you remove the posterior pituitary, these hormones are still released by the, the terminals further up um, uh, in the pituitary stalk. Um, up to about here. Um, if you destroy the neurons up here, then the ADH is no longer lost. Or certainly up here or higher. Certainly in the hypothalamus, um, there are lesions that will destroy these nuclei. But um, actually, if you remove the posterior pituitary, um, you're probably not going to cause loss of. Uh, ADH and vasopressin. So ADH is regulated itself by two um, major stimuli. One is um, this, the plasma osmolality, and you know normal plasma osmolality is generally between about 280 and 290 in this range. Um, but as the osmolality goes up from 280, ADH levels correspondingly go up. And very importantly, um, somewhere after 280, from 280 to 285, um, thirst um, starts to intervene. So when your plasma osmolality hits 285 to 290, not only is your ADH level going up, but you're getting thirsty. And the other stimulus to ADH release is, is hypovolemia. Um, hypovolemia is actually a potent stimulus, but it really doesn't kick into gear unless you have very significant depletion of the heart. You pretty much have to be hypotensive um, for, for hypovolemia to stimulate ADH significantly. Um, you can see how it pretty much takes about a 10% loss of blood volume before this starts to real, really go up and it gets up actually higher than plasma osmolality in the stimulus. And um, there is a, a classic feedback loop for regulation of ADH where both osmolality and less commonly circulating blood volume 
uh, lead to increased thirst uh, if, if osmolality is increased, the volume is decreased. This tends to, uh, to, to uh, cure or resolve these problems by causing water retention, which decreases the osmolality, increases circulating volume, and it actually reduces ADH back to, back to normal. So if you look at the causes of polyuria in this patient, uh, solid diuresis um, certainly is a classic cause. What would be the most common cause of solid diuresis? Probably um, not that long term. Diabetes. Um, but there are other causes too, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, primary polydipsia. Um, uh, not common, but it tends to occur um, in people, actually, with two types of people, people with, um, often with psychiatric disturbances, especially if they're on drugs that cause. Dry mouth, um, the phenothiazines are classic for doing that. Um, uh, there are sometimes people with hypothalamic disorders, um, uh, but often it, it tends to be people with psychiatric disturbances. Um, nephrogenic diabetes and sickness, um, basically, um, the, um, diabetes. Uh, DI caused by resistance to ADH. Central diabetes is diabetes and sickness caused by ADH um, depletion or insufficiency. Um, typical causes of nephrogenic DI that you would see in hospital. Yeah, this is near the top of the list. And anything else? Not uncommon. Um, the hypercalcemia would be another um, the most common cause, although there are certainly others. And the central diabetes we'll talk a little more about. But in terms of other causes, we talked about hyperglycemia, um, high protein feedings, again, protein is important solute, saline and loading. Um, certainly, you know, a people with. A lot of saline, um, the saline diuresis, um, salt using nephrotheses are sometimes considered, but actually it shouldn't cause ongoing diuresis because of uh, tubular glomerular feedback, which reduces GFR, and therefore reduces um, blood flow to the kidney and, and tends to cause proximal or proximal retention of sodium. Post urinary obstruction, so often um, people with prostate, uh, probably occurs most commonly people with prostatic disease um, uh, in which there is uh, retention of sodium and other solutes. Um, this is usually short term. <coughs> We talked about primary polydipsia. And then central DI, which is a state of ADH deficiency, which results in a variable degree of polyuria. Um, it can be total, it can be 100% complete, or it can certainly be partial. Um, it's caused by disorders that involve the sites of ADH production. So that means. Um, the superoptic or periventricular nuclei uh, can also involve just the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, so that's less common. Um, it can also involve the superior portion of the neural hypothalamic pituitary tract. And of the major causes, this is kind of the, the typical list. Um, there are certainly congenital causes um, which, uh, which are identified in, uh, in infants and toddlers generally. Um, certainly, trauma um, or surgery, um, the trauma of um, um, head injuries of any sort, um, not really identified as 
was a cause of DI until 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, some of the tumors are uh, in those primaries, such as cranial synergiomas. Or the stomach, uh, classically lung and breast, and also some of the, the immunologic malignancies. And then there's a group of inflammatory infectious causes, uh, cell phone, uh, Lagerhans cell hysterocytosis, uh, Bedner's granulotosis, and there are a few other um, rare causes. And if you, if you look at the, um, uh, the, the frequency of these different causes, um, and this is this pie chart is based on three different studies, including children and adults. So we have to factor that in. But um, idiopathic occurs in about 40% of, of people. Um, and much of this is probably autoimmune in nature. Um, and actually, the term, most of you have probably heard of autoimmune hypothesitis or. Autoimmune is a pituitary gland. It's usually involves the anterior pituitary. Um, but you can get autoimmune um, involvement of the pituitary stalk, the infundibulum, um, also called the infundibulum neurohypothesitis, um, which is responsible for probably a significant number of cases of DNA. Tumor is 30%. Trauma, smaller percentage, inflammatory infectious, about 15%, and then some of this other uh, birth injury, radiation, <laughs> vaccines, and other, other things. So, nephrogenic DI, um, we talked a little bit about. So, it's basically uh, ADH resistance caused by a subnormal response of the ADH. And leads to a decreased ability of the kidney to conserve free water and concentrate the urine. And hence the, uh, kind of the colorless, low, uh, low concentration of urine in these folks. And if we look at the effect of ADH in the kidney, um, so this is a kidney tubule, we're looking at just a small section here. And if we look at um, the first step, uh, the effect of ADH, it binds to its receptor on the distal tubular cell, which activates the cyclic AMP system, um, which then uh, activates the aquaporin 2 pores, which translocate uh, to the tubular side of the cell and allow water to enter the cell where it eventually passes out of the cell and into the bloodstream. And that's basically how uh, ADH promotes uh, water conservation. So if you look um, at methylogenic DI, um, certainly, again, in, in younger patients, genetic causes are important. Um, as you might guess, if you have gene mutations in either the receptor, the vasopressin receptor, um, the vasopressin 2 receptor, um, which is responsible for renal actions, the vasopressin 1 receptor, the receptor is uh, responsible for vasoconstriction. Um, you can get nephrogenic DI, or if mutation affects the aquaporin 2 genes, um, that too can lead to DI. You mentioned hypercalcemia and lithium. Um, hypokalemia may also cause nephrogenic DI, and actually an important cause um, in pregnancy um, is the fact that placental vasopressinases will break down vasopressin, um, tending to cause a picture of nephrogenic DI. And it's one reason that pregnant women do tend to get polyurethane and polydipsin. So getting back to our patients, um, these initial tests um, <coughs> that were done about 10 days before I saw the patient um, were pretty unremarkable in terms of glucose, creatinine, and UN. The 
the sodium was then on the high side, high normal, 144. TSH was normal. Uh, serum osmolality was high, 302. And the urine osmolality was low, very low, more country. So, um, um, so, should have gone there. Yeah. Um, so, what do we do next? <laughs> um, so, this is a typical picture, though. Um, if you have certainly high borderline, high serum sodium, high serum osmolality, without any evidence of other solutes that are responsible, um, and a very inappropriately low urine osmolality. It certainly should be much higher, certainly higher than serum, to try to uh, correct this hyper osmolality. So, um, so generally, um, the, the test to evaluate these people further to distinguish between the three major causes must be only high salute, that primary polydipsia, pathogenic DNI, central DNI. The standard test is the water restriction DT, DT, ADP, or decimal pressing test. DDAVP is a synthetic vasopressin. Um, it tends to be more selective for the, the V2 receptors, so it generally is used more than um, the natural vasopressin, which also has to be given gradually. But this is kind of a standard protocol, um, and um, it's really a two part test. So, first, water restriction and then give laser pressing. So, anybody um, have a thought about what the value of the water restriction is? Why would we need to do that? Or what's the benefit of kind of restricting water before people assessing the response to laser pressing? Psychogenic. Ah, psychogenic. Yeah, so it is very important in terms of identifying people with psychogenic politics because they're really normal in terms of their ability to produce ADH and their kidneys response. So, but you have to get them to produce endogenous ADH. And the only way to do that is to raise the serum osmolality to a level that stimulates. And that level uh, is generally a plasma osmolality above 295 or a serum sodium over 145. So if you can if you can achieve this by water restriction um, and the patient has a normal response, normal it starts to uh, concentrate their urine you can eliminate psychogenic polydipsy. It can get a little complicated because they've been doing this for a long time, they can wash out the, you know, the, the solid gradient in the kidney, but generally um, that works pretty well. And if you do have some of uh, psychogenic polydipsy, they'll usually uh, increase their urinized morality to about 500 or 600 just by water restriction. So the, the, what happens after that is you've got the people um, who don't, um, don't concentrate in urine, and that's where ADH is necessary to distinguish between central and nephrogenic DNA. So this patient, um, we actually didn't kind of do a formal um, test uh, because we knew that even the baseline, her, her serum sodium osmolality was fairly high, um, so we really didn't have to even restrict her beforehand. And, um, but when we did her baseline tests, uh, they were very similar to previously, serum osmolality very high, urine osmolality very low, sodium 24, 
And after being given uh, desmopressin or DDAVP, two hours later, the urinalysis morality uh, had increased significantly, um, well over 100%. And that's, that is the key, the key response one is looking for. So she did respond well to ADH. And if you look at the criteria for assessing outcomes, uh, we talked about primary polydipsia. Um, these folks were usually increased their urinosmolality to normal, which is just more on description. So we don't even have to give them this more question. With nephrogenic DI, most patients never increase their urinosmolality over 300, or over that as a plasma. So that's one important point. They may increase um, their uh, their urine has morality a bit uh, because they may not have the defect. These patients don't usually have complete resistance to antibiotics, so they might have a mild response. Um, but uh, those with central DI will usually have a marked increase in their urine has morality, uh, even if it's only mild. Uh, it still needs to get up well over 300. Uh, so this test is usually um, pretty effective. Um, there are some additional tests that can be done. Um, hypertonic saline infusion kind of a way to um, increase plasma osmolality without water restriction. Um, but generally it's not used unless for some reason um, it, it just doesn't work to do a, um, a one restriction test. Uh, what about plasma or urine EDH? Anyone ever measure vasopressin levels? No. Uh, I don't think I have either. <laughs> <laughs> um, it can be done, um, but the assays are not very good. Um, and there's actually just a lot of evidence that it adds up from the lot. So, I think right now, um, the status is if you do a water restriction DDAVP test and the results are confusing or non diagnostic, um, consider doing a test and measure ADH. Um, therapeutic trial of DDAVP, um, actually, not unreasonable um, if you don't have a clear cut answer from your diagnostic tests. Um, usually you'll find out within a few days if people respond to you with a trial. Um, occasionally people will actually skip the formal testing and go right to this. So, getting back to our patient, um, so she pretty much met criteria for having central DI. Um, one point in terms of her history, uh, Central DI classically uh, develops fairly acutely. I um, don't know exactly why, but um, patients will usually say they started becoming symptomatic uh, with either a name, the actual day, or within a few days. Um, Neutrogenic DI or primary polydipsia, patients are usually very hazy about when the problem started. So, by history, um, this patient also fit into the central DI picture. Um, she started a digital crescent nasal spray, uh, one puff daily, um, at bedtime, uh, and eventually ended up taking one puff. Um, most people take digital crescent intranasally. Um, we'll talk more about that, but um, this is fairly typical. Um, and she had some other tests done. Um, uh, her CBC, her uh, comprehensive metabolic panel, SED rate, angiotensin converting enzyme, uh, anti nuclear antibodies, rheumatoid factor, TPO antibodies, intrinsic factor antibodies, ferritin and folate were all normal. Interestingly, her B12 was low. Um, any connection? Any of these tests are below B12 to, 
to the cause of our diabetes and sickness, and how do we determine? Yeah, actually, um, the autoimmune hypothesis or infundibular neurohypothesis um, is associated in many cases with autoimmune mortality. So um, we're actually not that unusual to find other antibodies in mean, people with that um, etiology, um, even though these antibodies are negative. Um, this was confirmed in the case of Mendel on B12. And um, we did look at her, her other hormones, particularly the pituitary hormones, which were pretty much, I don't have the normal values here, but um, LH, FSH, prolactin were all normal, um, which uh, at least these would be expected given her normal menstrual periods. Um, IGF-1 is a measure of growth hormone, is normal, her free T4 was normal, as was her TSH, <laughs> and her AM cortisol, uh, not kind of non-diagnostic, but not particularly abnormal, either low nor high. Um, and she did have an MRI of the brain that was more, including um, uh, focused views of her pituitary hypothalamus. So, um, any thoughts as to what might be going on here? I don't want to vote for the uh, most likely cause of her disease. Cortex, third ventricle, cerebellum, brainstem, 
here's the two Terra star, and the medium elements up here. So this is where the, the nuclei are that, that uh, with the new neurons that produce ADA through LTV. And if we look at this um, figure, so here's the sphenoid sinus. Um, here's the pituitary, right here. And there is a the pituitary gland, right there. And right up here um, is the optic chiasm, right there. And this arrow points to something that looks a little white and fuzzy in here. That wasn't seen initially. And that was pre. Uh, Pre-contrast and after contrast, things are certainly clearer. Here's a pituitary lighting up, and here is something in the pituitary stalk um, at the base of the hypothalamus here. And there's the optic chiasm just going over the, the top of that. And if we look at a coronal section, um, and here's this, you know, it's Looks a little funny there, some thickening probably. Um, here's the pituitary down here. Um, here's the optochiasm up here that doesn't light up, and here is a mass um, in the pituitary skull. And um, there are actually people that have done measurements of the pituitary stomach, and uh, you might have gotten a report that says. The pituitary stalk is enlarged at four or five millimeters in diameter. Um, and this, I think, was measured as five millimeters in diameter. Uh, often it's no more than two or three at most. So now we have a lesion in the pituitary stalk. Um, and if we look at at least one study, though, which is fairly typical, of uh, 65 pituitary stalk lesions, uh, about a third in children, two thirds in adults, uh, about one third turned out to be tumor or tumor like, uh, roughly a third inflammatory or infectious, and the other third were congenital. So in this patient, congenital is pretty unlikely. Usually so early, um, we're probably dealing with almost a 50-50 likelihood that this is either well falling in one of these categories. So, and if we look at, and I'm, I'm going to skip the congenital, um, again, so it's, it's very unlikely, but if we look at the inflammatory infectious category, again, we have this uh, autoimmune um, uh, cause the IMH, um, which is fairly common, sarcoidosis um, uh, up there on the list in adults, Lyme cell histiocytosis, um, former cause histiocytosis X, and other names, uh, Regner's TB, um, formerly uh, fairly common, but no longer, and Wickham's disease, which is due to a bacteria. Prothorema Ripola. Um, not a whole lot of cases reported of that. And then in terms of neoplastic lesions, uh, germ cell tumors. Um, certainly a uh, major concern, especially in children and young adults. Um, cranial pharyngioma is a specific um, type of tumor, often very large, has a typical uh, cystic uh, appearance and often in the MRI. Uh, again, metastases, we talked about some of these when we talked about DI. And then primary tumors, um, uh, other primary tumors other than germ cell tumors, um, both malignant and benign that can affect the pituitary stuff. Um, and if we just look at the children again, the most common causes of the pituitary stalk lesions are, um, let's see, uh, hypoplasia has to do with congenital forms.
But if we take away congenital forms, it's either lager Hans cell histiocytosis or germinomes. And if you look at adults, the variety is much greater, but many of them, excuse me, have IH or autoimmune disease, metastases are up there, sarcoid is up there, uh, lymphoma, leukemia, and then uh, this is dwarfism, again, with a genetic cause, and a wide variety of other things. So, um, and this is just another, this is a photo of a male. For some reason, this often occurs in men more than women. But um, here's a coronal view, here's a sagittal view, here's a pituitary, and here's uh, the lesion of a man with uh, IMH. Pretty similar, in fact, larger though than our patient. And here's uh, another man with uh, sarcoid of the pituitary stuff. So these lesions do tend to light up. <laughs> so, going back to our patient, um, she had a, a whole bunch of studies. <coughs> uh, all these studies, uh, CSF and serum for beta HCG, um, uh, uh, alpha fetoprotein and placental. Um, alkaline phosphatases were all done because they're markers for germ cell tumors, some, some germ cell tumor types. Bone survey, visual fields, mammogram, chest and abdomen CTs. Nothing really impressive. Um, but she was started out in vivo thyroxine because her TSH was getting towards the low end of normal, as was her 3 to 4 It was concerned about central hypothyroid. And uh, by this time, the patient was actually um, referred to the neuroendocrine center at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And um, they were following her. Her headaches were getting worse. She was complaining of blurred vision. It seemed that she was requiring more desmopressin, and that was somewhat subjective. So she ultimately underwent a biopsy of her uh, pituitary hypothalamic lesion. And that's a, a kind of the question of when to do a biopsy is a tough one. Um, biopsy basically means doing transphenoidal surgery. So it's not the kind of biopsy to be taken lightly. Um, but there was concern about her progressive headaches and the rapid development of this lesion. So, so at surgery, um, the surgeon removed about a 12 millimeter pumpkin seed-like lesion attached to the posterior portion of the pituitary stalk. The pituitary gland appeared normal, and the lesion was removed from the stalk. And the pathology, um, could show a subarachnoid lesion. Okay, and any votes as to what we're dealing with? Characterized by proliferation of clonal dendritic cells, 
um, which actually longer has cells are a normal epidermal cell, um, but these dendritic cells accumulate in various organs. Um, they were identified by the same person who identified the eye of the cells in the pancreas. Um, when he was a medical student, he did this. Um, and um, uh, identification of the clinical syndrome began in the late 1800s. Um, and this term, Lyme-Brown cell histiocytosis, was adopted in 1987 to replace all these terms which were thought to represent the same, <laughs> same disease. Um, initially, in this term was used to represent these three different presentations. Um, LCH was used to replace this. So it is definitely a rare disease. More common in children, probably one or two per million. Um, some people say incidence, some people say prevalence, really not know. It's most commonly diagnosed in very young children. Uh, gen genetics are unknown, it's rarely familial. Um, pulmonary involvement tends to occur mostly in adult smokers. That's one of the few kind of associations with any um, environmental um, contacts. And as I mentioned, Lagrange cells are normally found in skin and mucosa, and these um, lesions in this condition express the same antigens as the skin cells. But most evidence suggests that Langerhans disease cells um, don't come from these skin cells. Um, and whether the, uh, what's really interesting is it's actually not clear whether LCH is a neoplastic disease or an inflammatory disease. Um, I think most people today think it's, uh, it's basically a neoplastic disease with an inflammatory component. And this is just a photo of the stain, the special stains for the protein lagering that these um, cells make. Um, and this is a, an, an electron a microscope view of a Lagerhans cell. It has this characteristic folded nucleus. And these are the dendrites that that stick out along the edge. That's where, it, that's where the term dendritic cell comes from. And these are called uh, burbet granules that used to be cathodonic of uh, LC, LCH, but are no longer necessary for diagnosis as long as you have this type of staining um, that this patient had. So just very briefly, um, the clinical manifestations of LCH, uh, the extent of disease tends to vary by age. Very young children are at the greatest risk for acute disseminated multi system disease involving multiple organs. Uh, older children and adults tend to have more indolent disease, uh, sometimes with just single organ involvement. Um, and the frequency of overall organ system involvement. Bone is clearly most commonly involved in uh, skin next. And then lymph nodes, liver spleen, and lung um, come next. And interestingly, there's a tremendous spectrum in terms of the estimated incidence of CNS pituitary hypothalamic involvement from 5% to 50%, kind of depending on the, the group you're looking at. Can also get thyroid involvement um, over the next year. So, when it comes to um, kind of in the longer on cell world, they tend to group endocrine and CNS involvement together. Diabetes insipidus is the most common CNS complication. Um, but these folks can develop anterior pituitary deficiencies. Um, it's almost always after. DI occurs. Um, and some of these patients will become panhypopituitary. They can also get hypothalamic involvement. 
become, they can become hyperphagic, obese, um, adiastic, um, um, at least part, partly, if not totally. So they can lose their sense of thirst, which becomes a real problem if they have diabetes and syphilis. And then these other issues may go along with it. Um, one concerning problem is the neurodegeneration, which occurs on the smaller percentage of patients. They develop cerebellar, basal ganglia, or pontine lesions that can cause gait disturbances, tremor, uh, cognitive behavioral abnormalities, and other neurologic features, um, which is a, certainly a major, can be a major problem in some, some patients. So, in terms of treatments, uh, we talked just a little bit about this patient. Desmopressin is preferred over AVP, uh, not only because it's more selective, but it, uh, this can be given orally, although uh, usually, usually it's given intranasally. <clears throat> um, sometimes pill like pills are less potent, sometimes need to be taken two or three times a day. Um, intranasally, it's usually once or twice a day. Um, and people with mild DI, sometimes just a low solute diet works reasonably well. Uh, we may not normalize urine output, but can certainly improve it. Um, if you don't have much ADH, the amount of solute in the diet is what determines your urine output. So um, sometimes this helps, but, but patients have to be pretty um, dedicated to their diet. Thiazide diuretic may also um, help. Then there are other drugs, uh, propionide and profibrate, uh, tend to stimulate ADH secretion. So in addition to do that partial um, um, uh, DI, um, this may help. Um, Non-steroidals and carbamazepine um, can enhance the effect of ADH in the kidney. So sometimes they're used also, but in general, desmopressin clearly works the best, probably with the few side effects, um, and certainly with people with severe DI. And the goals, uh, first of all, first goal is to reduce bacteria, because um, that uh, you know, certainly sleep problems um, uh, have a major effect on people's lives. Um, and after that, the goal is to at least partially reduce daytime diuresis. So I don't want to totally eliminate uh, the diuretic effects of the DI because then one has to deal with the risk of water retention and hypernatremia. Um, hypernatremia is not usually a problem um, unless thirst sensation is impaired or access to water is limited. Um, when thirst sensations are paired, um, both hyperlatremia and hyperlatremia become a serious risk, and, and these patients often have to be on very strict um, intakes of water. Um, they often need to get their sodium levels checked on a weekly basis, um, or sometimes even more often. In terms of nephrogenic DI, uh, the good thing about nephrogenic DI is it's, it's usually not that severe. Uh, and um, often it can be corrected by treating the underlying disorder or stopping the family drugs, especially lithium, if possible. Thysone diuretics work pretty well, um, sometimes with the familiaride or without. Familiaride can help prevent uh, potassium loss. Um, in children, um, apparently, um, the combination of thiazides and low dose non steroidals is often used for the treatment of nephrogenic DI. And in people with partial <coughs> nephrogenic DI, sometimes just giving them desmopressin um, will improve their response also. So giving them a pharmacologic dose of desmopressin. May increase their, their renal response. So, if we get back to this patient, um, 
um, she generally did well postoperatively, except she had a uh, CSF leak uh, intraoperatively. That was noted intraoperatively, not intraoperatively, that required an abdominal fat graft to seal the resection cavity. Um, so we had one of the problems of doing biopsies and surgery folks like this. Um, Post-op, she developed adrenal well, she developed ACTH uh, deficiency, resulting in adrenal insufficiency, and started on hydrocortisone. Um, it was felt that this was probably transient and would probably resolve, although that's not clear yet if that's the case. Now, she was continued on Lipothyroxin uh, and Desmopressin. Um, she was uh, evaluating the Dana Farley Cancer Center for, for LCAs. Um, I guess since the oncologists see these patients as probably the best indication and it's considered a neoplastic disease. And um, after looking at all her previous tests and additional tests, um, there was no indication that she had any, any evidence of LCH outside the pituitary hypothalamus. So she was not receiving any specific treatment um, for the LCH other than the treatment uh, for her endocrine problems. So she's uh, right now only surveillance um, is planned for her non-endocrine LCH issues. And she continues treatment for her central hypothyroidism, central hypocortisolism, diabetes insipidus, and she was started an oral contraceptive um, for her central hypothyroidism. That's it. So, there are any questions? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 